Good morning, everyone. It is Palm Sunday, and I hope that everyone had a chance to pick up a palm branch on their way in. We are going to be using music this morning that just makes you want to wave your palm branch. And we're not going to be the only ones because the Sunday school that has gathered downstairs also has palm branches, or at least they had a couple of weeks ago because they took them home and made videos about Easter Sunday, uh, sorry, not Easter Sunday, Palm Sunday parade. And we're going to be seeing that in a minute. And even before we get to that in the service, there's something special happening at the beginning of our Palm Sunday service. And I'm going to wait a moment or two more while the Sunday school gathers at the door of the sanctuary to say goodbye to Tara Davies. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> We're going to see the kids again in the service on the screen. Uh, they're going to be downstairs for the whole service, but uh, when it comes time for time for all ages, and we're talking about Palm Sunday and Palm Sunday parades, we're going to get to see video that was taken of the kids showing us how it should be done, <laughs> showing us what Palm Sunday could be like if we wanted to get uh, joyful and jumpy and, uh, and, and think about it like that. I want to remind everyone that as we come together this Palm Sunday, we are on land that has sustained countless generations of peoples over thousands of years. People who have come together for festivities, I'm sure sometimes lasting a whole week, such as our Holy Week uh, observances this uh, today. We acknowledge in Markham that we walk and meet for worship upon the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabeg people. We also acknowledge that we are on treaty lands, uh, lands of the Williams Treaty. We are all treaty people, and we seek to be on a path of reconciliation with all our treaty partners. At St. Andrews, we have a mission and a vision. Our mission is to inspire faith, practice compassion, and build connection in our community and the world. Our vision is to be creative and courageous people empowered by the spirit to practice love, reconciliation, and justice with authenticity, to be a spiritual home where Jesus' love for all is visible as we serve our diverse and multi-generational community. And as we come together with palm branches, we are going to light the Christ candle to remind us that we have to be careful with lit things around the candle, but that Christ's light is in our midst. And I want to draw your attention to the announcements. I hope you've already had a chance to read them in the order of service that was emailed to you earlier this week. And please take time to do it if you haven't. The services this coming week are going to be on Thursday and Friday. Monday, Thursday is on Zoom only. Please keep yourself comfortable at home. Bring bread or crackers, bring juice or wine, because we'll be celebrating communion on Monday, Thursday at 7 p.m. On Good Friday, our service is at 10 a.m. And again, we will be on Zoom only uh, for our Good Friday. Easter, 
I hope that you are all invited to come here or stay at home and join together on Zoom for our Easter Sunday worship in just one week's time. The other announcement I want to make is not in the order of service. It's the news that we make with prayer and thoughts to the Lumley family. Sandra Lumley passed away. I don't know how far the news has gotten already. I understand Sandra has been a member, a participant in the church for quite a long time. I don't have the information about arrangements that might will be coming out hopefully in the next few days for from the family of Sandra Lundley, who we remember this morning. I invite you to pass the peace of Christ. Those of us who are in the sanctuary, please pass the peace of Christ with your uh, with your gestures and on the screen at home, if you are able to go to gallery view, you might be able to see pictures of others who have gathered together on Zoom, as well as us. The one, a couple of the pictures on your screen will give you uh, the image of we who are in the sanctuary. The peace of Christ be with you all. Let us come together as we uh, begin our prayer of approach. Let us join our hearts and minds in prayer. <clears throat> Loving God, as the gates of the city swung open to welcome the humble King, so may our hearts be opened to Christ's spirit among us. As Christ wept for the people, so may we weep for those who suffer at the hands of those who have forgotten how to love. Let our worship service today express the joy and sorrow, the laughter and weeping of the first Palm Sunday. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. The first hymn we're going to sing is one which I know you're not going to be able to keep your arms down at your side. You're going to have to get them up way up higher than what we usually do in the United Church. Uh, in the United Church, we usually wave like this, but this is really what we're supposed to do on Palm Sunday. And I hope that you folks at home find something to uh, wave for this uh, first opening hymn. Uh, Hosanna, loud Hosanna, the little children sang. <laughs>
seated. And let me say thank you very much. I wasn't sure if you were actually going to wave them or not, and I'm delighted that we now... For the other two hymns this morning, I'll let the Spirit move you. I'm not going to push you or insist that you continue to wave your palm branches, but uh, I'm not going to stand in the way of the Spirit if the, uh, the Spirit invites you to, to do that. Let us continue in worship as we come together in prayer once again. Let us pray. We come at the beginning of Holy Week, O God, mindful of the journey your Son took through the streets of Jerusalem. We are mindful that he did this journey for us and for our sakes, and that he showed us the kind of love which embraced even the most difficult of times the hatred of those who were threatened by his appeal and by his power of loving words and kindness. We confess, O God, that we continue to look at the words of love which might make a difference and wonder whether or not we can repeat them in the midst of crowds, in the midst of angry mobs. Hear now, O God, our silent confessions. Hear all these prayers we offer and in your love answer. Amen. Hear the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. We have come to the beginning of Holy Week in which we can follow Jesus' own journey through renewal, through difficulty and challenge. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. We're going to sing together now the story of that Palm Sunday from Voices United 124. He came riding on a donkey. He came riding into town. Let us stand and sing together as Michael leads us. Yeah. 
And now let us listen as Gwyneth reads for us from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19, one version of Jesus' triumphal arrival at Jerusalem in the midst of palm branches. Luke 19, verses 28 to 40. After he had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he had come near Bethphage and Bethany, at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. And they were untying the colt. Its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They said, the Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus. And after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you very much, Gwyneth. Let us bow in prayer. Lift in us the spirit and the understanding of these words, O oh God, as we think again about your arrival in Jerusalem. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Here we are at the beginning of another Holy Week. Here we are where we welcome Jesus' arrival. And even as the people of Jesus' own time saw him come into the city in what can only be described of as a rather strange way, we are invited to reflect and to think about what that means to us and what difference it makes that this is how Holy Week starts. This is how 
all of the activities that we read about, not only in Luke's gospel that we heard from this morning, but from all of the other gospels, some only telling part of the story, some which do not contain all of the many busy and significant activities that happened after Jesus' arrival. When Jesus was close to Jerusalem, I can only imagine that he had to stop and think for at least a moment about what was going to happen. How were people going to receive him as he arrived? I think that we can be fairly sure that people had some idea who he was because in many places in the Gospels, we hear that not only did Jesus affect the people that he spoke to, he affected the people that they told because his reputation spread. And so even uh, who, though a lot of people in Jerusalem had never seen him, had never met him before, his reputation preceded him. And once they heard, who is it that's coming? Jesus, oh, I've heard of him. I, he's heard that he's the one that has done all kinds of strange and marvelous things before this. So we want to see for ourselves. We want to see what difference he might make right here when he's talking to us, when he's coming into our city. But we have been reminded in many ways, not the least of which is the writing and work of the biblical scholar John Dominic Crosson, we have been reminded that when Jesus arrived in Jerusalem, his was not the only procession. Likely it wasn't the only procession that day. It's quite likely that from the west, from the sea coast of the Mediterranean, Pilate was coming into Jerusalem. He would have been on a large horse. He would have been followed and surrounded by armed soldiers. He would have created a stir because that's the only way that a political leader was able to maintain control over a people who, especially at this time, coming up to Passover, might be unhappy, might be ready to protest against the governing people. Pilate, we are reminded, wanted to be in Jerusalem before Passover, because that's when things might get stirred up, and he needed to, to use a modern phrase, keep a lid on it. He needed to be there with his soldiers to make sure that anyone who smacked of thoughts and ideas about self-rule or determining their own future without the Roman occupiers, this would be the week when the crowds might react, might follow a leader, might do things which soldiers had to contain, soldiers had to put down. As Pilate arrived from the west, high on a mighty horse, Jesus arrived from the east, from the Mount of Olives. Jesus was, whether he uh, planned to or not, creating a stir. And as modern scholarship has really uh, gathered all of this sentiment, it is very possible that Jesus knew that Pilate was coming on a mighty horse at the same time that he told his disciples to go and get a donkey. It would seem as though Jesus, and I don't, I don't use these words lightly, had a sense of humor. He knew that his arrival was going to be compared to the arrival of Pilate 
and he wanted people to think deeply about how different he was, where his power came from. It didn't come from the armed soldiers surrounding him. It came from God's love. It came from a love which recognized people for who they are, their dreams of self-rule as a way of becoming closer to God, the freedom to practice their religion, uh, not covered up by the idea that Caesar was the son of God, which is the predominant religion of the Roman occupying forces. Caesar was God. Jesus arrived as a king, a very different kind of king from the one who entered Jerusalem possibly the same day on the other side of the city. And having come into Jerusalem that day way, the arrival of Jesus invites us to ask ourselves once again, what kind of king is Jesus? What kind of ruler do we have in our lives? Do we give honor and glory to that which keeps so-called peace by force, by force, which is without a doubt the idea that many people yearn for? They would like to think that we can get rid through force of the things that hurt us and harm us and cause us pain, to get rid through force of the things that stand in the way of our prestige or our status. And as we continue in our own day and age to listen to the news and to hear story of those who think that might is right, we celebrate Palm Sunday where we are once again it is proclaimed that love conquers all that it is not the mighty who end up capturing the hearts and imagination of the word it is the revelation of a courageous and a challenging love that embraces even those who might not fully understand how to care how to show compassion how to cooperate, how to move, come closer together and move forward in love. Palm Sunday invites us to ask the kinds of questions which all generations have been faced. Who are we? What is it that makes us come together as a people? I invite you to listen to a story. This is a story from some time ago, which is in many ways very disturbing, but I think in a, its own very powerful way is able to, that is to consider what it means to say who we are in ways that uh, a less disturbing story cannot do very easily. When Jesus arrived in Jerusalem, his disciples had to decide for themselves whether their love for Jesus and his love for the world was stronger than the things that might take his life away. And on Monday Thursday, when he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, he showed them exactly what kind of love he wanted to offer the people who welcomed him into the city. Washing feet had always been a servant's job, but it was a job that Jesus now did lovingly. And the disciples would soon see that Jesus was not yet finished showing the world the power of that kind of vulnerable, loving, service. In 1980, one of the last letters that Ida Ford wrote was to her niece on the occasion of her niece's 
16th birthday. Ida Ford was one of four nuns who went to serve the poor in El Salvador and who was raped and murdered by government soldiers. I tell the story this morning because I see in it the kinds of things that we are asked to do in our own lives, the kinds of questions that we are asked about who we are, even as we enter into our, the holy weeks of our lives where conflict and challenge faces us uh, all around. Ida wrote often to her family. While she was in El Salvador, they would receive letters. And that makes me think that before she left, there must have been a family gathering, perhaps several, which probably included a meal where while everyone was chatting noisily, someone must have asked, so how long will you be gone? What will you be doing? Are you sure it is safe? But Ida did not choose this path by its safety. She was going to serve. When her niece, Jennifer, in Brooklyn turned 16, she got a letter from Ida. Ida told her about seeing, just the day before, the body of a 16-year-old who had been killed in the streets. The reasons for such killings, she said in her letter, are very complicated. But one thing that is clear and simple is that many people have discovered something worth living, sacrificing, fighting, and even dying for. Whether their lives last 16, 60, or 90 years, their lives have the same meaning for them. Ida went on to say to her 16-year-old niece, the same thing isn't happening in Brooklyn that's happening in El Salvador. But a few things remain true wherever we are and no matter how old we are. What I want to say to you is this. I hope you get to discover what gives life a deep meaning for you, something worth living for, perhaps even something worth dying for, which gives you the strength and excites you and enables you to go on. I can't tell you what that should be. You have to discover it for yourself, to decide for it and love it. I can only encourage you to keep looking for it and I will support you as I do. We may never be faced with a decision such as the ones that Ida Ford had to make. There is no question that people in Ukraine are many times a day facing these very decisions. Our paths of service may never require us to risk physical death. But one thing that Holy Week does teach us is that a life of service, of Christ's love, is a life that is not held down by fear or false hopes. It's a life that steps forward boldly out into the world to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, we are not alone. God is with us. Thanks be to God. Let us bow our heads in prayer. May we enter this Holy Week with the kinds of questions and struggles that help us to figure out forcefully who we are and how we can, with courage, share your love even with those who think we are silly. Go with us this Holy Week, O oh God.
อเมน As we continue to move closer to Holy Week, we are going to be encouraged by the music, the singing of the choral bells. Who, as though all of you have heard them sing many times, I think we can all say haven't heard here for two years or more, and it's wonderful that you're going to be able to lead us in worship. Coral bells are back. <laughs> Thank you, Michael, for putting up with us again <laughs> and playing with us this morning. Thank you. You very much, Coral Bells and Michael. It is good to be here again and listening to your music. And as I know, because I've been sneaking around this building, there's going to be others singing here in the sanctuary, solos and trios. And at some point. In the not too distant future, oh, the choir may be making a regular appearance during times of worship. It is good that we can offer our music, our talents, our singing in the same way that we offer our support and our gifts of money that sustains the mission of our community of faith. 
that sustains our expression of God's love in the world. And I want to say how much your offering continues to be appreciated even through the uh, end of the pandemic when we still are not able to pass the offering plates from one person to another in worship, but you have still found the way to bring your gifts and your support here on Sunday morning through the week and online and through the mail. As we acknowledge the tremendous support that you give, let us sing together the hymn of dedication, grant us God the grace of giving with the spirit large and free, and the words are on the screen. be seated, but I invite you to continue to use your singing voices because the verse which we come together in singing before the prayers of the people is up on the screen. Open our hearts, open our minds, open our lives to you, and we'll use this verse before the prayers of the people and then again before the Lord's Prayer uh, after the prayers of the people. Michael. together in prayer. Loving God, we lift to you hearts filled with thanksgiving. We offer you our gratitude for so many things which often we don't notice as we are busy and distracted with our daily lives. We thank you for every breath we take in breath which offers us renewal and new life every moment of our lives. We thank you for the food that nourishes us, food which is grown with care and hope in all parts of the world, including those places that are being ravaged by war even now. We give you thanks, O oh God, that this world sustains us in our hope and our love as much as it makes it possible for difficulty and hatred to try and take hold. Hear our prayer, O oh God, as we lift to you the people of Ukraine and all those who are reaching out even now to receive refugees to receive those who need care and love and more than all else hope that this war will end soon and that those who have lives have been disrupted will be surrounded by community and the hope of those who see love and justice as the strongest way into the future together. But we also pray, O oh God, for the many other areas of conflict around the world which 
have not received the same coverage in the news as Ukraine in the past month and more. May your loving care be present in all those places where hope and support are needed for those who are fleeing from conflict and from disaster. We pray, O oh God, for those in our community who are facing the challenges of illness and difficulty. We pray that they might know our care and concern is with them and that our prayers are used with their names on our tongue and in our hearts. Hear all these prayers we offer, O oh God, and in your love answer, for we pray in the name of the one who brought us together to learn how to pray. Let us sing, open our hearts as we prepare to join in the Lord's Prayer. Open our hearts, open our in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The hymn is number 127 in Voices United. Ride on, ride on in majesty. Let us to come together in singing as Michael leads us.
Let us go into the world with a daring and tender love. Let us go in peace. The world is waiting. And whatever you do, do it for love and in the spirit of Jesus, who is your Christ. Amen. Thank you.